presentation. We have a wonderful and exciting presentation from our own consultant on, on the Constellation Regional Collaborative team. So we will get started. Um, again, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have a presentation today um, on health equity and social determinants of health. Um, our agenda for today, uh, we'll start off with our introductions and then we'll go right into our didactic presentation um, that will be presented by Jametta Magwood Golston. Um, we'll go ahead and pause um, for any questions and discussion points. And then we have our first case review for our ECHO series, which will be presented by Delina Rainey. So we're really excited about that. And again, we'll have another opportunity um, to leave some time for discussions. And then we will close out our ECHO series with information on our next session and our post echo survey and closing comments. All right, we'll jump right into our introductions. Um, for our participants who are joining us today, please take some moment um, to share your name, your employer, your organization, um, your, pos your position and any credentials you'd like to share with us. It just helps us to better understand um, our participants and tailor our future presentations um, to those disciplines. And while our participants are doing that, I wanted to take a moment for our subject matter experts to share your name, your position, and just a brief background. We will start with Dr. DePetty. I think you're muted. Yeah. Oh, we can't hear you, Dr. DePetty. Thanks, Maxine. <laughs> I did the video and not I forgot the mute. That's okay. Well, these days I'll get them both. <laughs> Thanks everybody for having me and good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure, obviously, to uh, to be part of today and and what an exciting uh, topic uh, from from Jametta that we're going we're going to hear. I'm the health sciences distinguished professor here at the University of South Carolina and South University of South Carolina School of Medicine. I'm an internist, uh, physician, former dean also of the School of Medicine here, and my longstanding career, including academic and clinical and research career, has been in cardiovascular disease, but particularly and almost solely hypertension. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, DePetty. Um, I do not see Dr. Lachlan, um, but hopefully he'll be able to join us um, sooner, but he's another subject matter expert. Um, but I'd love to um, turn it over to um, Dr. Brettler for his introduction. Thanks, Maxine, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Brettler. I'm an internist and hypertension specialist. I uh, worked uh, my whole career at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, where I've um, had the privilege of leading the hypertension re uh, program there for the last eight or nine years. I also work as a consultant uh, for the Pan American <laughs> Health Organization and am faculty at the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And then we have Emily Ridley. Hello. Uh, good to see everyone. I'm Emily Ridley. I'm a clinical pharmacist with Prisma Health in Columbia, South Carolina. I work within an internal medicine office. Work with, work with our hypertension team and have long worked with patients um, with hypertension, diabetes, and all um, patients who um, are have uh, a lot of challenges with health equity and access to resources and such. So this topic is very near and dear to my heart today. Um, that work with our team here and have worked with uh, Paho as a consultant. So good to see everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to our subject matter experts. Um, we have additional subject matter experts who cannot um, be here as yet, but we have Monty Robinson, 
um, Honey Estrada and um, Jametta Magwood Golson is also one of our subject matter experts and one of our faculty um, for our ECHO series. So um, we are excited to um, introduce a full introduction to Jametta as uh, we get started on our didactic today. Jametta is a university professor and also a public health consultant. And she has focused her career on pop population health and health disparities. And we are really excited for this presentation because she's focused a lot of her research in rural ge geographies, lung cancer and pain management and social determinants of health. We are really excited for this presentation and welcome Jametta and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction and allowing me to take a few moments to share a little bit of my passion with um, our ECHO group here. Uh, so for the next few minutes, I'd like to chat about patient care and health equity in the social determinants of health and health care access. Sorry, this chat is no longer available. Sorry, Alexis is talking. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, we will be able to identify the social determinants of health. Um, we'll also take some time during the presentation to define health disparities and health inequities to ensure that there is an, an understanding of uh, for each of those concepts, but also that we make sure that we differentiate our approach to each of those. Uh, we'll discuss health equity and how it differs from health equality. Many times we operate as if they are one in the same and they're not. Um, hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll understand better the importance of achieving health equity, and then just spend a few moments discussing strategies for providing patient care through a health equity lens. All right, so one thing I want us to do during this presentation, right, because I'm going to circle back and ask this question again as I close out my portion of the presentation. I would like for each of us to think about how health equity is evident and you would fill in the blank. So how is health equity evident in my workflow or the workflow in my office? How is health equity evident when I'm interacting with my peers? How is health equity evident when I am interacting or having discussions or conversations with patients, right? We wanna make sure that at least for the next hour or so, we're keeping health equity top of mind. So as we're going through, be prepared. I am going to circle back uh, because I, I would like for us to really take time to think and reflect on our current strategies and our current processes and what we're doing to ensure that health equity is present, present excuse me, and that we work to sustain the presence of that health equity. Next slide. All right. So let's jump by, right in. I would like to um, just take a minute to examine this visual, right? When we look at this visual, which ultimately displays the depth of the impact of socioeconomic factors on an individual's overall health, right? We see healthcare at the bottom at 20%, health behaviors 30%, the end My apologies, the one time I'm talking. Um, and uh, the physical environment at 10% and socioeconomic factors at 40%. Studies show that 40% of individuals' health is determined by socioeconomic factors like housing or food insecurities, their social status, their education attainment, um, occupation, or their income. And these are the things that we want to work to ensure that we are either 
uh, mitigating or eliminating for patients as barriers when they come into our office, when they encounter us, whether that's through the conversation, through promotion and education, just helping them make the connection between the impact of these things that sometimes to some seem, to some seem trivial, um, but to those who are experiencing it and going through it far from trivial. Next slide. So what is health equity? Let's define health equity. Health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. That definition comes from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, but in the most simplest way, health equity is when we create a level playing field for not individuals, for, for all individuals to be able to access health care and have um, experience fair health outcomes. So just think about the words that are in this definition, fair, just, opportunities. Those are loaded words for a lot of people and for many groups and populations, when they come into the world, those really aren't words that correlate with their race, their ethnicity, with where they're going to be going once they you know, leave the hospital, the environments that they grow up in. So these are the things that we have to think about that from, from birth, the circumstances or the playing field, which I just referred to, isn't level, okay? We wanna make sure we understand what health equity is, but we also wanna make sure we understand what health equity isn't. And it is not the same. It's not sameness for everyone, right? It is not just everyone being able to go to the local health local healthcare provider. Yes, the doctor might be down the street, but I need insurance to, to be able to go to the provider. I need transportation to get there. When I get to the provider, am I going to understand what they're saying to me? Are they communicating with me in a way that I'm going to be able to understand that? So as we continue to venture on this path to health equity, it's a must that some things are addressed and centered. For many populations, there's always going to be the historical context around contemporary injustices, right? We try to plan interventions that assist in overcoming those economic and social um, obstacles, but then there's there are also the determinants of health, right? And, and for some, they are in their many, right? And then we work to eliminate preventable health disparities. So these are just a few things that as we're on this path, saying, hey, this is where we want to be. We want to achieve health equities. These are key, key uh, considerations that we have to keep top of mind. Next slide. Back up. So the attainment of the highest level of health for all people, um, where everyone has that fair and that just opportunity, opportunity to, to access care, right? That, that level playing field. That's where we hope for everyone to be ultimately. But we must realize that there are factors across healthcare systems. There are factors in uh, healthcare offices with providers and patients that contribute to the health disparities. So when we think about the foundation of health equity, it begins with the disparity. Here, we're looking at disparities from two different perspectives. We have health disparity, which is the incidence or the prevalence of the illness or injury or mortality in certain populations within certain groups. On the other side of that is the health care disparity. That's the distinction. That's the difference between the groups in their insurance coverage or them being able to access healthcare and then utilize that healthcare. And then there is the quality of care when they actually make that visit or have that encounter with that healthcare provider. The most important takeaway from today, I hope out of everything that I say, even everything that Ms. Rainey is going to say, 
is that disparities are unnecessary and they are avoidable, right? They can be mitigated and they can be eliminated. So this is the purpose of the intersection of public health and um, clinical care, right? Just attempting to be more proactive, okay? Let's take some time to understand a little bit more about our key drivers of disparities, which is the social determinants of um, health. I just wanna go over what that looks like a little bit. Next slide. All right, so in our journey to health equity, social determinants of health are there and they are always going to be present. Those are those non-medical factors that influence an individual's or groups or population's health outcomes. These are the conditions in which individuals are born in, they grow in, they work in, and they live in, right? When we plan our interventions, at least as public health advocates, we're always keeping this top of mind because our goal is to make sure that our interventions aid or assist in overcoming some of these economic and social barriers but also in the delivery of direct care to patients, that should be the goal too. It is absolutely impossible to be able to effectively, I'll say, deliver care if I really can't go to the pharmacist to get the prescription because my insurance won't cover it, it's not affordable, and many other situations and scenarios that play out in our priority populations and just target populations or populations of focus in general, okay? So if for nothing more than the successful delivery of, of, of care, um, we always have to ask ourselves, what is it that we're doing to be a part of that solution, right? How is it that we're working in our domain or even within our small practices, what is it that we're doing to possibly be a part of the solution? And not necessarily for the whole group, but just for that maybe one or two individuals that we have encountered that day, because it does make a difference. So being able to address these differences and distinctions in social determinants of health or SDOH, however you would like to frame it, that is how we accelerate our progress towards health equity. Next slide. Backing up a little bit, I, I talked about how some individuals still reminisce over some of you know the contemporary and historical injustices. Um, that their group or their population may have experienced. Yes, it is 2024, but it is still important to recognize the history of many cultures and populations and how many of those groups have endured um, systemic disparities and gaps in pain in healthcare and how it, in 2024, from how many ever years ago, how it affects and impacts their interactions and relationships with not just providers, but actually the clinical community as a whole. This could range from, do I ask my doctors questions while um, I have them in my face? I absolutely want nothing to do with the medical community, but I know I need this assistance. So I go to the doctor, I get the bare minimum and I leave but that's not effective care um, either. So, it, you know, there is still responsibility on the patient to, to have the desire to own their care, but it is falls back in that clinical piece and public health piece where we have to create these supportive environments where it's not just you, the patient, this is what you need to do, but that gained framed messaging where it's we, and we're rephrasing it to, you know, this is our goal and that sort of thing. But ultimately, it's instances uh, like that where the, the biases towards certain populations um, stem from, from the patient perspective as well as the provider perspective. So one thing about 
uh, disparities in healthcare is when we really examine race and ethnicity and the distinctions and the difference, um, we always need to look at it, the system level factors as well as the individual and the physician behavior. I feel like it sounds like a lot and, and a lot of responsibility and it is, but those are the things that we, we take up when we say, okay, this is what I wanna do. These are the individuals that I wanna treat and work with and work for and advocate for because a lot of times in these groups and populations, they don't have voices. And so when we take these things up and we own them, it is our responsibility you know, to, to be their voice or to assist them in finding their voice. Next slide. Our health equity lens and clinical intersection. So understanding that health disparities is shaped by various determinants. I think we've established that. Um, but healthcare providers have a more responsibility to advocate for equitable access to healthcare and assisting patients, groups, populations in addressing, mitigating, eliminating those social determinants of health that uh, contribute to health disparities they encounter. Next slide. Right. How does health equity look? When I look at this illustration, I know how I would hope health equity looks, right? And so what we're looking at here is an equality visual versus the equity visual. And a lot of people like to stop at equality. Well, I did it, right? I did it, but I didn't do it to make sure that everyone could use it, right? I bought all of the kids in my neighborhood a bike, but I didn't get training wheels on the one for the three-year-olds. So they can't use it, right? So equality is achieved when each person or group of people, they're giving the same resource or they're giving the same opportunity. Equity is our goal. Equity is where we get when it's recognized that each person or, or group, they have different circumstances. And so sometimes the resource alone is not enough. Right. Sometimes they they need to be uh, there needs to be something that's supplemented to help them be able to utilize that resource. Health equity prioritizes social justice in healthcare, unlike health equality, which is just the equal piece, like equal treatment for all patients, which is still a great thing. I would not negating that at all, but health equity adds to that. Right. Health equity prioritizes meeting the patient where they are, treating that treatment or <clears throat> prioritizing that treatment for the patient and their care based on what they need. What did they present to you? Everyone in the office who has uh, hypertension or who's diagnosed with hypertension, they don't all have the same needs. They don't all have the same barriers to their care. So why should all of the treatment plans be the same? Right. So that's where um, the equity perspective comes in and helping us examine that and, and hopefully encouraging us to identify how to meet them where they are and, and help them get what they need um, to be successful or more healthy. Next slide. All right, our health equity lens. I just wanted to take the next few slides to discuss our approaches or some of the approaches uh, that we might be using within our practices or within our work, uh, corresponding actions um, to each of those approaches. So cultural competence or cultural humility really is what we're, um, is what it's termed as now, but the action there would be a shared or mutual respect. Being able to understand and respect the patient's diverse uh, cultural backgrounds, their beliefs, their practices, their values, those are things that the patient receives. That's how we start to create that foundation of trust that I spoke of earlier. Active listening acknowledge the patient. A discussion or a conversation usually goes both ways. 
Um, so acknowledge what they're saying, acknowledge their perspective, welcome their perspective. And this will help us adapt care plans to meet their cultural needs when we are actually taking the time to understand, you know, maybe why they feel like they shouldn't take all this medicine. Or maybe they want to supplement with herbal remedy remedies um, that has been known to work for someone else in their family. Like listening um is a powerful mechanism. We've chatted a bit about our social determinants of health, but you can never, you know, uh, um, <clears throat> focus on that piece too much because it is important to continuously recognize the impact of those social and economic factors and how they could impact an individual's um, health status and their outcomes. Community clinical linkages, who are we connecting them with? We know that many communities and uh, cities have resources for housing and food um, security or insecurities, transportation and financial assistance. But, but are these organizations really active in um, our communities? Are they working with the goal of helping these patients sustain? Um, improve, improve and sustain, I'll say, or is it just temporary? We give them the basket and, and, and then they go home, the food basket, and then they go home. Like what else could we possibly offer them to ensure that maybe they don't need to utilize this service again? And not because we don't want them to, but because we've helped them stand up or fill that gap that um, that is currently there. Reducing barriers to access and offering flexible appointment scheduling. I, I, I phrase both of those as the, the most appropriate action being equitable access. Of course, we want to make sure there's equitable access to the services that healthcare services that all patients need, need, regardless of their socioeconomic status and race and where they're from and where they're lit, where they live. But offering flexible appointment scheduling may not work for me because I work eight to five, too, and I don't have the type of job that offers PTO, right? And I cannot get off work, but I really need to see the doctor because I feel like I feel terrible. Um, I'm still trying to function every day. Like, what do I do? How, how does that type of service meet me where I am? So, Concessions like offering flexible appointment scheduling is really, really valuable to some people in, in a service that I'm, I'm for certain they would take advantage of because there is a need there. Um, next slide, please. Advocating for policy change, representing and creating a voice. Earlier, I mentioned that some of these groups, they don't have a voice um, in certain circles and realms. So when we do have an opportunity to be their voice or help them find their voice, um, that promotes health equity at multiple levels, the local level, the state level, and even the national level. So these are things that if we can, we would love to focus on. Mitigating implicit bias, um, and participating in bias awareness training, training. Implicit bias is that subconscious bias or feeling, I'll say, um, that an individual may have um, due to prior influences and imprints throughout your lives, things that you really may not believe, you know, you believe or you may not believe you really feel that way, but they're present and that's why they're subconscious. Um, but awareness does help with that. Recognizing and addressing that implicit bias in clinical practice or clinical encounters helps to ensure fair and unbiased treatments of patients and individuals that we encounter. Um, and that's key as well. That also speaks to forming that foundation of, of trust or that standard of, of trust and then in, in, a, in creating a comfortable environment for patients who may not be so comfortable entering the environment. Okay. Promoting health literacy. Um, we got a lot of pamphlets out in the waiting room. There are magazines. I can't read that. You know, so we have to make sure that we, we have it available, but does everyone understand 
the message that um, or the intent of that pamphlet or brochure or this flyer that you gave me. Um, I was teaching a, a course one time and there was a nurse in the course and she did not speak uh, Spanish, but she was working with a Spanish speaking patient. And so she, at that point, was showing him, you know, how to administer insulin to himself. So she said, she, I took an orange and the needle and I, you know, injected the orange or I stabbed the, the orange, punctured the orange with the needle. Um, and that was how I demonstrated to the patient, you know, what they needed to do to help manage their numbers. However, the patient kept coming back and their numbers were still wacky, still out of control. And so she said, why well, I, I attempted, you know, to ask him or I had someone come in to ask him because Spanish wasn't her. Um, she didn't speak fluent Spanish, I'll say. Um, I had someone to come in and translate, you know, to ask him, you know, show me how you are administering the insulin. And he took like not to himself, but he was using the orange. Like so, so like there were so many missteps. There are so many opportunities. He was not using the needle on himself. It was an orange. Those are missteps, things that should have never ha happened um, in a clinical environment. Why don't you have a translator on hand or someone uh, that you could easily access to communicate with that individual? So we want to make sure that they're getting the message, they're receiving the message, confirming that they received and understood that message. Effective communication is very important. Um, using plain language, visual aids, and teach back techniques for checking comprehension, something that that individual clearly did not do uh, initially when it should have been done. Next slide, please. Okay, so lastly, um, engaging in community partnerships, collaboration is extremely important. We want to make sure that our collaborators um, are, are stakeholders. We want to make sure that they value the same things that we value in patient care and in um, public health. So you have to meet your community and the contributors where they are. Um, being present, participating in community health fairs, creating visibility of your office or your organization, that's important. Also allows an opportunity for firsthand um, health promotion. Okay? Uh, monitoring and evaluating outcomes and collecting and analyzing data. So overall improved comprehension of demographics factors and evidence-based quality um, efforts. We lean on evidence. We need our data. So everything that comes in, like we should be tracking quantitative and qualitative information by demographic factors so that we can identify present disparities, consistent disparities, and where those opportunities are for us. We should continuously be <clears throat> evaluating to assess the effectiveness of interventions that we have put in place, or is there an opportunity for an intervention, right? Tracking, you know, how our services are being utilized, if they're being utilized, then could they be better utilized? If not, those might be messages that we communicate to our partners or um, at community health fairs, right? When we're there having that presence and, and um, promoting health or whatever service we might be promoting, but those are opportunities for us uh, to continue to share messages and um, to inform quality improvement overall. In everything that I just said, I, I want to make sure that I just reiterate how, you know, we want to make sure that we communicate, when we are communicating, we're communicating the, the we issue of this or the our, our issue of this, not a you thing. Um, Adding that that positive spin or positive um, outcome lends to motivating and encouraging individuals to move the way that they need to move or should move if they are able to do so. And if not, hopefully they're communicating, well, I can't. And then that starts other conversations and discussions that might need to be had. Um, 
Next slide. I'm going to rush through my last few so we can have time for a case study. Okay. In, in stroke care, I know we have some um, individuals that specialize in stroke care. So I, I did want to make sure I, I took just a few minutes to chat about disparities that we're specifically seeing in stroke. I won't go over the ones that we know um, are common in larger groups or larger populations like the geography and you know insurance piece but a few things that I noticed with stroke were um, EMS utilization the referral to treatment and then just some of the care pathways that providers recommend in certain groups or certain populations versus another populations. And for our minority population, there was always, at least in the research, you know, delays in treatment or delays in care or a delay from the door, you know, to a needle stick. Simply, not simply, but they're basing it you know, off of the race and, and uh, ethnicity piece. Then there's the utilization of EMS for transportation to the hospital. So of of course, if you go to the hospital via EMS, you, you know, you're able to go directly to the back, your uh, medical evaluation happens with greater urgency, uh, you probably have or you do have faster imaging times uh, with shorter door to needle times. But also what research is finding in this population specifically is that not everyone is going to the hospitals by EMS. They're going to the emergency room, which delays their treatment time, right? Um, it delays, you know, the, the length of time that it takes them to get to the hospital. You gotta stop at red lights. You're in the emergency department waiting. It may not be as long once they realize, you know, your, your symptoms, but there is a delay when we uh, factor in the race and ethnicity of individuals who are experiencing this. And we understand and recognize that stroke disproportionately affects racial minorities, right? With Blacks experiencing their first ever stroke at a twofold greater risk than white populations or when compared to white populations. And that's what the evidence states. So here, even in our specialty cares, um, there is opportunity, you know, for us to focus and improve practices as well. And my hope is that these are, you know, continued conversations that we can have because these are um, opportunities, potential opportunities, I would say, you know, to, to collaborate and work together and to address. Next slide. Persons impacted. There is a list here, a great list of persons who are impacted, commonly impacted, I would say, and involved when we talk about health equity and health disparities. But what is important to understand is that when we get to the point where we can say we've achieved health equity or we are intentionally working towards health equity, everyone benefits. So regardless of whoever is listed here, everyone has the potential to benefit if we are actively working on um, towards this path. Next slide. Our health equity work just uh, needs to ask questions and seek understanding when we um, have patients in our face, when we're encountering them, take the time to understand their perspective, ensure systems thinking and risk taking. Um, we understand that this is this isn't something that's going to happen quickly. Right, but as we continue to do it, we continue to practice it, it will become routine in our um in our daily workflow, in our conversations, and just in our patient encounters, most importantly. Next slide. <clears throat> Full circle. I wanted to take a few moments. I know I said that I would come back to this question, but I don't think we're gonna have time to um do the activity that I wanted to do, but just Remember, you know, to continue to ask yourself if it's on a daily basis, you know, well, how is health equity in that decision that I just made? Or how is health equity evident in uh, what I just told that patient to do or in the conversation that I just had? Did I consider them? Did I listen to them? Did I, do I understand 
their needs, just making sure that it's top of mind and everything that we do when we're functioning in the capacity for or serving someone else or like our, our patients and our priority groups. Um, and the second question I wanted to pose was, um, how can and will you adopt health equity tools and concepts in practice? You know, if there were things in here that you're already doing outstanding, but there's always room and opportunities for improvement. That's a part of our continuous improvement and continuous growth. Uh, so just think about, you know, what changes do we need to make in our practice? And it might not even be in our practice. It might just be well, we, we've got everything. Now it's time for us to partner. Now it's time for us to reach out. Now it's time for us to be an example and show other um, practices or systems what we're doing, how effective it is, and to help them get there as well. In our call to action, um, I want to make sure that we work to seek to improve the teams, teams meaning our provider team understanding of health equity. It would be very difficult to try to work towards health equity and you don't have a baseline. You don't know, you know where the individuals you're working with are. So we need to understand it and then seek to improve it. Um, work to promote equitable care in your practice and your collaborations and just make sure that we are being intentional in partnerships that we form and try to strengthen those partnerships. Um, achieving health equity requires intentional collaboration and commitment from providers, community organizations, our advocates, policymakers. So we want to make sure that we lean on those partnerships um, and call them out on the things, you know, that they're saying and doing and, and hold them accountable as well um, as we work to strengthen partnerships. Uh, next slide. All right. So now we are going uh, to transition to our case review. Um, who's going to be presented by Ms. Delina Rainey. Delina is a behavioral health consultant in Orangeburg, South Carolina. She um, works at a FQHC called Hope Health. And when I connected with her, um, I was very intentional in, in trying to find someone that would be able to offer the patient voice because they served patients in our priority regions, in our priority populations. Um, and so when I did have an opportunity to, to connect with her, I knew that she was perfect uh, to be able to represent the patient voice. She's passionate about her understanding um, of the complex relationships among the brain, genetics, environment, and mental health disorders to develop a unique and tailored plan for each patient. Um, and that was really evident just from some of the scenarios and things that she was sharing with me about her experiences. Um, so I will be quiet and I will let Delina share um, our case study today. And then we'll jump, jump into questions and, and uh, answers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so this is an integrated care patient. Uh, the age is 18 now, but when this patient first came into care, uh, he was about 15 years old. Uh, and the ethnicity is African-American. So the patient was identified for behavioral health treatment and nutrition visits after a med medical visit in November of 2021. So let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, we provide integrated services in a school-based setting. Hope Health is a federally qualified healthcare center, and we have several different locations in rural communities. And part of what we're doing for to improve health equity is to make sure that you have access to care no matter where you are. So if you, even if you're in school. And so in addition to having um, qualified providers in the clinic, we also have behavioral health providers in those clinics as well. So he started behavioral health services in February of 2022 to address his mood and health behaviors due to weight gain. He was seen again after that for a medical visit the following year in December of 2022, where his blood pressure and weight had both increased. So he fell out of care at some point and re-entered care later that year. 
So he came back into behavioral health counseling. And during that time, the behavioral health provider addressed the mood and the behavior. So the eating and um, to talk to him about taking medication, if, if that was, because that was just a suggestion by the medical provider, but he was really reluctant. So he declined to take any medications to help manage his blood pressure and weight. And then he stopped coming altogether. This patient has a history of high blood pressure in his family. So his mother and father uh, also had uh, concerns about their blood pressure. And I believe his mother is deceased and the and she died from kidney failure. And the father also had some health concerns with his blood pressure as well. So he, although he declined it, he started coming back into treatment and we were able to get him to consider um, medication because his blood pressure continued to increase, but also his weight began to increase as well. So once he re-engaged uh, with the school-based provider, um, she referred him again to get home things in place. So like gym membership, nutrition resources, and things that he could also do at home and a behavioral health integrated visit. He also started to see a primary care provider where he was officially diagnosed with hypertension. So this is a, a chart that we kept uh, just to monitor his progress. So remember I mentioned that he first started to experience challenges in November of 2021, and you can see the blood pressure and then his weight gain. And when he re-engaged this year um, and started taking medications, that blood pressure started to decrease as well as his weight. So with multiple interventions. So he has behavioral health, he has nutrition, we have all of these things available for him at Hope Health. And we also provide those services in person, or we also can provide them via telehealth. So he has access to all of those. So we will continue to work with him to get his weight lower and to continue to maintain his blood pressure with all of these interventions. All right, how was that? Thank you. That was right. great. Um, like, <laughs> and thank you, Jametta, um, for your presentation, being able to connect this, this uh, uh, important case study to this work. Uh, Delina, thank you for presenting that case study. I think it offers a perspective and that uh, intersection of those SDOH needs and the clinical um, uh, intersection. So, um, I want us to open it up for questions and discussion. Feel free to unmute yourself. You can um, raise the hand or just unmute yourself to ask any questions or comments on both of these presentations. That was a great presentation. Thank you for that. I think it makes it makes it real life sometimes for all of us to see the transition and changes that folks make and how interacting um, with our awesome friends down at Hope Health, um, actually gonna make a huge difference um, for that patient. So thank you. Amy, I have a question. This is Jimmy, of course. Um, how often uh, do you see mostly um, African-American males? Um, that's one of the questions for that. Um, and I know he was young. Um, and so that's the first question. Do you see mostly of African-American males, Black? And the other question is, is there, um, if they just walk away, is there someone to actually to reach out to them continuously to try to get them back in? So, you know, we won't have anything that's going to be detrimental to them. So those two questions I have. Thank you so much for your questions. We do have behavioral health case managers that will follow up with patients after their visit to check in with them, to kind of close the gap if there's anything that we miss or anything that they might need. If they do fall out of care, that's how we refer to it, they will reach out to them. And they do that by 
seeing how many appointments they've no showed or they missed um, because they are already with behavioral health, they automatically go on a list for us to do that follow up. In rural areas, um, for example, I'm in Orangeburg, the population is about 80% African American. And so we do see a large amount of African American men. We um, had a conversation at Hope Health recently where we engaged men in the conversations about their health and about their mental health. We had a couple of our clinicians that are also men lead that conversation. Uh, so we recognize that there are significant gaps in care for African-American men. Sometimes they don't trust the providers and they don't have time to get care. Uh, so we also offer um, different hours for clinics. So we have after hours, we have on call hours and things like that to try to meet those needs. We're working on doing a health fair in Orangeburg where we can make sure that Hope Health is really present and really doing some good stuff for people in the community. We used to only provide HIV care, but we don't just provide HIV care anymore. We have rheumatology, we have primary care, we have an internist, we have medication assistant treatment, we have me, uh, I do the counseling there. So we're, we want to be present and make sure we close those gaps with African-American men. Did I answer your question? You did. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jametta and Delena. Uh, this was excellent to have a case study to really bring the information home. And I have a couple of questions. And one, and maybe you said this and I missed it. Do you um, make home visits uh, when necessary? Are you able to make home visits? As we know, getting into the home, sometimes we learn so much more uh, about what the real issues and problems are so that we can, um, you know, recognize them and, and work to address them. Thank you for asking that. I don't make home visits, uh, but we do have a small team of people that occasionally will go out to the homes. Because we offer a variety of services, we have case managers and they oversee that. We, in my clinic, we have case managers for Ryan White and they will go pick patients up. They will go deliver uh, things to them. If it's like sometimes patients need insure or um, they might need hygiene items and they will do that. So we do have some engagement where people do go out into the field and engage with um, some of the patients that we have. Excellent. My other um, quick question is, uh, it sounds like you're very in tune to the patient voice, but I'm wondering, because in the regional collaborative, one of the things that we are working really hard to do um, in our newly forming uh, committees in the various arms of our work is to make sure that we have a person with lived experience and I'm wondering in your in your work and in your team, do you ever bring in um, any of the patients like this young man now that he's becoming more successful, you know, to really hear his voice and what has made the difference and um, incorporate that into your practice? That's an awesome um, idea. We do not have peers in primary care, we have peers in HIV or in substance use, but not in primary care. I think that's an awesome idea. I love to take stuff back and say, hey, I heard this today. What do you think about connecting people, but also recognizing a way to honor confidentiality? So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Um, I know time is coming up close. So if there are any other questions that you would like to pose, I will put the um, <clears throat> we'll put the email address on our last slide so you can send us emails and we can definitely get those out to whom needs to answer those. Um, and Sydney, if you would mind putting the email address in chat real fast also, thank you. Um, so just a reminder, uh, that we do need case reviews 
for our other sessions. So please go ahead and send in your case reviews. We, we appreciate that. Um, and they're through Red Cap. So uh, the link is in the email that I send out after the ECHO presentations. Our next ECHO session is going to be Thursday, September 26th. Um, and we are having Monty Robertson talk about his lived experiences with his family members dealing with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. And I will send out the email for the post echo survey. If you could go ahead and do that uh, survey, that would be much appreciated. So we can make sure we're doing everything that we need to to make it the most educational and current uh, resources for everybody. And um, with that survey, then once that's completed, we are able to give out the continuing education credits. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for everybody that attended. Um, the our, our team, the Regional Collaborative, we appreciate all of your attendance and knowledge and insight. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I want to echo that. Thank you, Jametta, for your informative presentation, your, ex your expertise in this work is valuable to what we're doing um, on the Constellation Regional Collaborative, but um, being able to share this on one of our ECHO sessions will help so many of our participants. So thank you again. And thank you, Delina. We have um, learned a lot from your case study. This is our first case study for our ECHO session. So we really appreciate it. Thank you, Jametta, for that connection. Um, it was great to see that intersection of healthcare and those SDOH needs. Again, thank you all for participating. Uh, your participation in our series is what drives us. So thank you again. And if you have any follow-up questions or concerns um, for any future sessions, any follow-up to any of our presenters today, please go ahead and email us. You guys all have a wonderful day and thank you again.